I read to you now from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. I'm going to begin reading at the first verse. This is the Word of God. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put Jesus to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray Jesus to them. And they were glad, and they engaged to give him money. So he agreed and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? Jesus said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house which he enters, and tell the householder there, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you to a large upper room furnished. There, make ready. And they went and found it as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he sat at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me at this table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it was that would do this? Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may have heard the story. A six-year-old little boy went down to the neighborhood grocery store and he sought out the grocer and he said, I want the smallest box of Tide that you have. And the grocer said, why do you want the smallest box of Tide that I have? And the little boy said, because I want to wash my dog. And the grocer said, well, Tide's not the kind of soap that you need in order to wash your dog. The little boy said, no, my mama told me that Tide is the best soap of all. So Tide is the soap that I want. And the grocer said, well, all right, if that's what you want, that you shall have. And so he sold him the smallest box of Tide that he had. A couple of weeks later, the grocer saw the little boy again, and he said to him, son, how is your dog? The little boy said, my dog died. And the grocer said, I told you that wasn't the right kind of soap. And the little boy said, no, I don't think it was the soap. I think it was the rinse cycle that got him. Well, you see, sometimes we get caught up in cycles that get us. And I have to tell you that one of the cycles that's getting me just now 
is what I would call the complication cycle. It seems to me that we have a terrible tendency these days to try to make everything more complicated than it really needs to be. You know what I mean, don't you? If you want to know what the weather is going to be like tomorrow, you turn on the television set and the weatherman appears on the screen and he proceeds to deliver to you a veritable blizzard of complex information about warm fronts and stationary fronts and cold air columns and jet streams and isobars and barometric pressure corrected to sea level, whatever on earth that is, and radar scans and satellite pictures. And after he has deluged you with this tidal wave of complexity, he ends up by saying, so, tomorrow will be a nice day and the temperature will be in the 70s. That's what I call the curse of complication. We do have a tendency to try to make everything much more complicated than it needs to be. Perhaps it's just because I am so simple-minded myself that I have a hard time with that tendency to complicate everything. I keep remembering what Alfred Lord Tennyson said of the great Duke of Wellington. Tennyson said, as only the greatest are, he was in his simplicity sublime. That's what I'm yearning for, the sublimity of simplicity. I suppose that maybe that's why I so love the gospel story. Because you see, in spite of all the use and abuse the gospel has experienced through the centuries, nevertheless, it remains a story of exquisite simplicity. It is sublime in its simplicity. The gospel is simple primarily because Jesus himself was a simple man. Jesus was divine. That's one of our great Christian affirmations. Make no mistake about that. Yes, Jesus was divine, but Jesus is also human, fully human, we as Christians believe. He was uh, completely human. He was simply human. He was born just as we are all born, and as a matter of fact, the circumstances of his birth were plain almost to the extreme. He talked just as we talk. He went fishing in the early morning hours. He caught catnaps at mid-afternoon when he was tired. He had to worry about where his next meal was coming from. He let children play in his lap and swing on his arms. He was not a very handsome man. Did you ever stop to think about that? You know, the Bible is quite consistent in mentioning people who are beautiful or well-formed. The Bible always singles those people out and describes them as beautiful or well-formed. It's without exception in that regard. It says that was true, for example, of Sarah and Rachel and Esther and Tamar, of Joseph and Saul and David and Absalom. But what does the Bible say of Jesus? It says, He was without form or comeliness that we should desire Him. The Shroud of Turin has been much in the news in recent years as scientists have sought to prove or disprove its authenticity. But I want to tell you something. If the shroud contains the face of Jesus in actual fact, then Jesus was a rather homely man. He was without form or comeliness that we should desire him. He was plain looking. And Jesus also spoke plainly. He spoke very simply. 
if you take his parables as an example and translate them into our modern idiom and understanding, you discover that the themes of those parables were downright commonplace, easily understood by even the simplest of people, easily understood even by children. For example, Jesus talked about uh, uh, finding a diamond ring which you thought you had lost and would never find again. Jesus said that it would be infinitely greater to get into the kingdom of heaven than to win the Florida lottery. Jesus said it would be easier for a rich man to get into heaven than to drive a Mercedes through a revolving door. Jesus said, if your son asks you for a puppy dog, will you give him a black widow spider? And if your daughter asks for a hot fudge sundae, will you slap her face? You see, Jesus spoke in very simple, very earthly figures. Jesus was a very simple man. Oh, I know Solomon calls him the Rose of Sharon. Isaiah declares that he is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. David labeled him the Messiah. Haggai called him the desire of all nations. Malachi said he is the son of righteousness. The Gospels refer to him as the day spring from on high. Acts calls him the cornerstone. Hebrews labels him the great high priest. John in the Revelation says he is the Lamb of God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And yes, he is every one of these things. And he is even more than every one of these things. But as much as he is every one of these things... He is also a plain, simple, uncomplicated man. The gospel is simple because Jesus himself was simple. And the gospel is simple because it is addressed to simple people. Understand, please, the gospel is not intended for people who think that they have arrived in life. It's not intended for people who think they have all the answers. It's not intended for people who think that they are head and shoulders superior to everyone else. The gospel is not intended for snobs, spiritual or otherwise. No, the gospel is intended for people who walk ordinary, everyday, common pathways just like we do. The gospel is intended for people who know only too well their own shortcomings. People who know they have a deep down need for God in their lives. And people who know that that need can be met only through Jesus Christ. I know, as soon as I say that our access to God is through Jesus Christ, there are always those who are quick to say, well, aren't you being very narrow? Aren't you excluding everyone else? Well, let me uh, set before you the other faiths of this world, and you tell me if I'm being narrow. The Muslim believes that in order to get to God... You have to say your prayers five times a day. You have to engage in the month-long feast of Ramadan once each year. You have to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. You have to consistently give your alms to Allah. You have to give yourself to an intensive study of the Quran. The Hindu believes that in order to achieve eternal bliss, you have to observe certain social taboos. You have to eat certain foods and not others. You have to engage in certain physical privations, uh, some of which are downright painful. You have to engage in mental discipline, sometimes which does nothing less than alter your very personality. The Buddhist believes that in order to be one with the great all, you have to take to yourself vows of poverty. You have to negate all of your physical desires. 
you have to punish or flagellate yourself to the point where you reach a state of purity in mind and in spirit. Now, I set all of those complicated, involved, exclusive, restricting requirements and legalisms of other faiths over against the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel which says, whatsoever you ask in Jesus' name will be done for you. My friends, it couldn't be more simple. It couldn't be more broad. It couldn't be more open. It couldn't be more winsome. It couldn't be more uncomplicated. Jesus said simply, come and follow me. It's as simple as that. And the gospel is simple because it delivers a simple message. We see that message clearly portrayed in the exquisite simplicity of this sacrament. It's fascinating to me that Jesus, when he set out to establish a perpetual memorial for himself and for his message, chose to do that by using the simple elements of a common meal. Now, I suspect that if you and I had been charged with the responsibility of creating a perpetual memorial for Jesus and his message, we certainly would have sought to create a ceremony which was infinitely more spectacular with all kinds of pomp and circumstance, not Jesus. Jesus made it and kept it simple. Why? Because he did not want us to so focus on the memorial that we would miss the message. And the message is simple too. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. That simple sentence tells us precisely what we are to do. We are to show forth. We are to proclaim. We are to put into words. We are to demonstrate in our everyday living the dying, the rising, and the returning of Jesus of Nazareth. That's what we are charged to do. That's the message, as simple as it is. That's the message that we are to take to the world, and we are to take it aggressively. We are to show forth that message to the world. My friends, the good news of the gospel is just too good to keep to ourselves. We must take it to the world. I remember once sitting in the Scottish National Gallery of Art in Edinburgh. It was just down the hill from where I was in school at New College. And on this particular occasion, I was gazing at Salvador Dali's painting, Christ of St. John of the Cross. It is a depiction of the crucifixion, but it is a painting which has about it the glorious reality of the resurrection. And what I noticed as I sat there was that every person who passed by in the gallery halls that day, every person stopped and turned and looked at that painting. Now understand, please, it was not the largest painting, it wasn't the finest painting, it wasn't the most prominent or the most visibly displayed painting in the hall, not at all. And yet every person who passed that way stopped, turned, and looked at that painting. They didn't do that for any other painting, only that one. Why? I became convinced then, and I am convinced even now, that whenever 
the world encounters the loving death of Jesus and the reality of his resurrection, the world stops and takes notice. And so we are called by the exquisite simplicity of this sacrament to show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. To go out into the world with the message of his dying, his rising, and his return. And when we take that message to the world, the world will stop and take We go forth into the world in the name of a simple Savior, seeking to reach simple people in a simple way with a very simple message that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That, my beloved, is our communion commission. Let us pray. Almighty God, enable us to commit ourselves to the exquisite simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we may share that simple message with the people who are around us. In the name of Jesus, amen.